Uh, my name is Hannah, and I am feeling extra good right now because I am joined by River Shook of Sarah Shook and the Disarmers. How are you doing, River? I'm doing really good. How are you? I'm great. I'm great. I feel nice. It's a weird day, but happy to be here. Same. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's always a weird day on this planet, Earth, you know? <laughs> so, I mean, we are really big fans of yours over here at that station. I mean, we've had Night Roamer, your latest release on repeat for the past year. Um, and you're just such a staple within the music community in North Carolina. And it's just also been really awesome watching you carve a space for yourself and your music within the country music scene. And I know you've got a ton of developments in your life and in your music, and I've got a ton of questions for you. So do you want to just go ahead and dive right in? Yeah, that sounds great. Sweet. Let's do it. Um, so you just finished up a tour just a few days ago, as I saw. Um, and this was a tour that you were doing both with Sarah Shook and the Disarmers and your newest project, Mightmare. I would love to hear a bit about those two projects, the duality between them, similarities or differences, and kind of what it felt like to perform on the same stage with two different entities like that. For sure. Uh, yeah, I I um, recorded the Mightmare album, Cruel Liars, by myself in isolation during the pandemic. Um, just out of necessity, it became more of like a pop record that I intended it to. Um, to be. And um, that was largely because I didn't have, I didn't have access to a live band. I didn't have access to a drummer. So all of the drums ended up being like programmed drums, um, which takes away that element of um, sort of like raw indie rock band type, um, right. sort of, sort of how I had initially envisioned it. Um, and it took this turn and I'm, I'm really happy with the way it turned out. Um, and and I love it for what it is, but it wasn't until I started putting a band together for it that I started really hearing the songs as I envisioned them. Oh, initially. Yeah. Um, and it was really cool because um, I I put this record together. Um, I got, you know, kill rock stars on board. They're like, yep, we want to put it out. And um, I remember I was talking to my agent, uh, Chris Rusk, and I was just like, dude, you got to um you gotta book book me a tour book me like a two-week tour in october when the disarmers are like already off the road um and he was just like you don't have a band <laughs> <laughs> and i was like i will i will have a band i i promise by the time october rolls around i will have everything in place that i need um to make this tour a reality so you you do your job and i'll do my job and everything's <laughs> everything's gonna work out i promise so Mightmare went out on a headlining tour um, in October, this, this past October, and it was our, our first run. It was, um, it was incredible. It, uh, the show attendance was really good. I mean, like much better than I expected. Um, people were just really happy and really into the music. And um, it, was, it was very validating. And that sort of put this idea in my head um I think it was a couple weeks after that tour ended so probably early November um I hit up Chris again and I was just like dude what if we did this crazy thing where nightmare opens <laughs> the disarmers <laughs> and he's like you're gonna die <laughs> he's like, That's, it's so much work and I was like I'd let's just try it and let's do a short run and make sure that nobody dies and um <laughs> it's always good you don't yeah just like just make sure that it's it's logistically even possible and so he put it together it was um it was five nights um my guitarist Blake Talent uh, plays guitar in Sarah Shook and the Disarmers and also in Nightmare so he and I were the only two that like had double duty every single night um and it it was it was great it it went a lot better um than i imagined it um with the two shared band members um that meant there were only two additional people in the in the van okay. um and it was yeah it was it was really cool it was really nice to get out of um the cold and the rain and get down to florida and georgia and south carolina for a little bit that was a nice respite yeah. um yeah, but it it was wild. Nightmare is a um, very like, um, very much indie rock uh, with some some pretty. I mean, we have songs that are pretty much like 
like sludge doom metal and then we have stuff that's like really light and heartfelt and soaring um sonically and uh it's i feel like it's a really good match um with the two bands simply based on the fact that it's the same it's all coming from the same place and from the same spirit um you know i'm a person that has i will always have like a lot of questions about life and what it means to be a person and why we're here and like what we can do better um those are like the questions that really mean something to me and matter to me and i feel like that that comes out in my songwriting there's always a lot of questioning and searching and there's always a lot of i thought i had it figured out but i did <laughs> yeah it's a humbling so, experience to exist yeah. <laughs> it, it absolutely no, I, is i love the nightmare stuff and it it really is quite different from the disarmers work that you have but like you said i mean you're still this very core piece of it and if people like you and like your music I think they're going to love this new project too. So I'm excited about it. I'm excited to see how it continues to evolve. Um, let's talk about sobriety. <laughs> cool. <laughs> so um, I did see that you've been sober for about three and a half years now, which is phenomenal. Congratulations. Um, I think that's a hard feat for anyone, but especially for someone operating within the music industry. And so, you know, I mean, yeah, you're, you're touring, you're, playing shows really late. There's also this creative process that you're probably uprooting. And so my question for you is for any musicians or creative folks that might be considering a change like sobriety, what would be your advice or your words of wisdom for them? Um, well, first off, anytime um, I'm in a conversation about sobriety, I do like to make it very clear that sobriety was the right decision for me personally. Right. Um, I don't feel like everyone needs to quit drinking. Um, and you know, that's, that's a very personal decision. And, um, for me, I, I was at a point where it was, I was really using it as a, as a way to destroy myself. It was, it was super self-destructive. Um, you know, waking up every single day, just feeling like absolute hell. And I, I look back at those days sometimes where it was just like, I was doing blow and drinking just insane amounts of whiskey and staying up until like five in the morning and then being on tour and doing that for like a month for like 30 days. And, um, I feel like the older I get, the more I realize that it's, it's really not the big decisions that we make in life that impact us the most. It's like the tiny little things that we do every single day. Mm. Um, so for me, it got to a point where drinking was just really wearing down my health um, and and my mental health. You know, like a lot of us drink because we have social anxiety and it feels right. like this is this is like a little tool that like kind of helps a little bit. Um, and I think for a lot of people, it, it can be only that. Um, but for people who have like super addictive personalities, it can be like a slippery slope. Um, I feel like if if you are a person that is considering um, giving up alcohol or even just taking a break for a little while, um, you know, make sure that you tell like a person that you trust um, so that you're not, you yeah. don't feel like you're going through it alone. Um, and someone that you trust that's going to be like supportive and validating. Um, but uh, I don't know, for me, sobriety wasn't, just about like quitting drinking it was like trying to completely change my whole approach to life and myself um and i think it has to have a little bit of a bigger meaning for it to stick um i i wanted to be a healthier person physically for sure like i was really looking forward to not waking up super hungover every day but also i realized that a, a lot of the reason i was drinking was to avoid um, past trauma and, um, just like a lot of messed up stuff from my childhood that I didn't at the time have the tools to deal with. And alcohol was the tool that I had at the time. So it was kind of this mindset of, okay, I need, to, I need to find a better toolkit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Cause, because what I have is like, it, it's kind of doing the job, but it's also doing a lot of damage in other ways. Right. Um, 
yeah. So if it's something that you are interested in and you want to try, um, you know, approach it from a standpoint of, I want to be better and I want to feel better and I want to get better. And all of the little decisions that I'm going to start making to get to that point are going to be really important. And honestly, for me, the biggest thing that helped me with my sobriety was making a a new habit that was simply to go on a 15 minute walk every day, not 30 minutes, not an hour, literally 15 minutes every day, just like no matter what, no matter if I felt like it or not, you know, throw my coat on, grab, grab the keys and just go for a walk for 15 minutes. Well, it's, I mean, you Um, started this by being like, it's about these little things, right? And, and that right there seems like a little thing, but it's that routine that can kind of keep you afloat when it feels really heavy. I think, I think I had been going on my daily walk for a little over a year. Um, and I, I I was just kind of in my own head walking, like not really thinking about it. And it just, it hit me out of the blue, like how, like I had this flashback to how I'd felt when I first started the habit. And I realized like this, like the walking is not just the walking. It's about showing yourself that whether you feel like it or not, like you can accomplish stuff. If you're determined and you buckle down and you make up your mind, like I'm going to do this no matter what, it's this tiny little thing and I can handle it. It's just building confidence in yourself again. Right. Um, like teaching yourself that you're someone who's trustworthy. That's a really big right. deal. Yeah. yeah Preparing your relationship with yourself. <laughs> It's, it's so real. I'm like, yeah, tr- <laughs> trusting oneself, it shouldn't be that hard, but uh, it is nearly impossible sometimes. But no, you're right. Yeah, those little things, they add up. And it's that's cool. That's cool. Yeah, I, uh, I also do the little walks and I tend to think that nothing's happening in my brain during them. But I'm like, if there was like a receiver, it would be absolutely <laughs> all over the place. Like it was just burr, 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 all, all up in there. But um, so something something else about you is uh, you are a queer person, obviously within the country music scene, um, and you're in the South. And I think those are three things that historically folks would not wrap up together. Um, But I think that's changing. And I think we're seeing it change. And so how have you seen country music and seen the South grow and evolve over the years or not? Um. Honestly, I I feel like queer people have always existed in the space of country music. Um, Obviously, a couple decades ago, you you couldn't be out as easily. Um, I mean, I I wouldn't be surprised at all if a lot of like the classic artists from sort of the golden era were like bi or gay or pan or whatever. Um, But it's just, um, it just wasn't a time where that was something that you really talked about or were open about. So I think the change that we're seeing is not the result of some kind of, you know, like, oh, well, everybody's gay nowadays. It's it's not that that's changing. It's just that people are more comfortable talking about it and people are more comfortable being out, um, which is really interesting on the social side of things because you see you see people just like, you know, all up in arms is just like, you know, well, gay people are taking over country music. And it's just like, we're not, we're, (laughs) we're just doing the same thing. Yeah. We've always been here and we're doing the same thing you're doing. We're, we're on the same side. (laughs) (laughs) We both love the same thing. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. This denim jacket's big enough for everyone. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. That's, that's a good way of putting it. It's like, it's not necessarily growing. It's not changing. It's just becoming more clear in a way. And I think that that is, um, that's hard for a lot of people to, um, to come to terms with um, when you're raised in like the super conservative, um, you know, religious environments that, that have like all of these very strict opinions about um, right and wrong and gender roles and gender in, in general. Um, and I, it's weird because I, I feel like there is a, a balance that needs to be struck. Um, I think I started using they, them pronouns like a year and a half or two years ago. 
Um, and my, actually my younger siblings started using they and them pronouns years ago. My parents are still struggling. Um, <laughs> you know, they're, they're like in their sixties and it's like, you know, every once in a while I'll get a they or a them, but like most of the time it's, you know, it's like the old stuff. Cause that's just, that's the way their brain works. Um, right. and I'm, I feel like I'm always kind of recalibrating my, uh, sort of approach to how other people deal with that and perceive that because obviously we live in like a climate where like that really like a lot of people just get really upset about it Mm -hmm. um and for me it's just like I know who I am and I'm comfortable with myself my pronouns are they them if people choose not to use them like I'm not going to let it bother me um and a big part of that is because it is so new I think right Um, And because I was raised the way that I was raised and I believe the things that a lot of those people still believe. And it's just like, I understand that because that's my background. Like Mm -hmm. that's, that's like how I was raised. Those are all of the like mindsets and worldviews that I was accustomed to for the majority of my life. Um, So being on the other side of it, I, I have a lot more kind of like understanding and compassion because it's just like, I had to come out of that too. And I needed, I needed people to like help me get there with information and education. And um, those are the things that I I feel like are like make the biggest difference. It's just like, just have a conversation with somebody. Mm -hmm. Um, Everything is so like polarized right now. Um, And, and at the end of the day, to me, it's just, it's way easier to just like have a real conversation with somebody where like I can, I can just like talk to somebody and, and share information without ego being involved, you know? Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. Those, those perspectives are, are things we got to really count our blessings on. I think um, yeah. just being able to put yourself in someone else's shoes is difficult to do a lot, but um, when you've, when you've been wearing the shoes for a while, it's, it's kind of a funny <laughs> situation to be in, you know? Yeah. I've been um, in those shoes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I've worn those. Um so you got a big show coming up at Lincoln Theater, taking a little yes. break from tour, then you're going to go right back on the stage. Uh, so yep. on Saturday, you'll be at Lincoln Theater. Uh, Kate Rudy's going to be there. That station will be there. We are very, very pumped about it. It's all we can talk about. So how does it feel after, you know, touring around the country and touring in so many different places to be back home in North Carolina playing a show? Um. It feels good and it feels weird. And um, we we just did our third Europe run um, this past, like in August and September. Um, and I feel like I, I still just have moments where it's it's so, it's, it's such an unnatural way to live, to tour constantly and to be all over the world and to constantly be in new environments. Um, you know, like human, like human psychology, like our brains make these like little maps of our living area. We know where like everything is. And when you're constantly, when you're literally in a new place every single night and like, not just a new living space, but like a new venue, like your workspace and your living space every night is a new place. Um, I love it. Like I, I kind of thrive on the chaos. I guess. Yeah. Um, But at the end of the day, you know, if, if I had limitless financial resources, like I would probably never leave my porch. I would (laughs) stay in my little house in the woods and, um, you know, probably have a garden and do a lot of reading um, and just spend a lot of time in silence because I, I love the quiet. Um, But all of that full circle back to the show. um, I'm really, really excited to be back. Um, in Raleigh specifically and at Lincoln Theater specifically. It's, it's been a little while um, since we've been there. Um, I remember when I first moved, uh, when my family first moved back to North Carolina, I was 19 and we moved to Garner. And um, nice. I, re- I yeah, I know. <laughs> I just remember being a teenager and um, kind of getting the lay of the land and, and learning like you know, what venues Raleigh had to offer and the Lincoln Theater always seemed like this like huge, you know, at the time it's like I'd never played or been anywhere near that size. So it's really cool 
um, it's really cool to be to be back there. Um, and I'm I'm really looking forward to the show. I cannot I cannot wait. Yeah, we're really yeah. really excited about it. Um, hopefully, everyone listening will be there as well. It's going to be a good night. And so yes. I got just one final quick question for you. Um, what can folks expect from you, the Disarmers, and Mightmare this year? And how can they keep in touch with you? Yeah, um, well, we've got the show um, at the Lincoln, and then we're off for a little while. Um, you can keep up with Disarmers touring schedule at disarmers.com. And Mightmare is mightmare.net. Um, and we'll be leaving for tour for South by Southwest on March 9th. And I think we're out for like 30 days. Um, yeah. And I'm flying um, Ethan and Ash, the other two members of Nightmare, into Austin. Um, so both bands are going to be doing some like some day parties and some showcases. And um, it'll it'll be a lot of fun. And then we'll be on the road together again. And it will literally be like all my favorite people in the same place. So um, I'm excited. <laughs> That's a good deal. If you got to be stuck on a little bus with people, it's hopefully ones you like. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, River, this has been awesome. Thank you so much for taking some time to, to chat with us. I know you have a ton going on, but um, for everyone listening, please, for the love of anything that is holy, go <laughs> to Lincoln Theater on Saturday, January 28th. Uh, Sarah Shook and the Disarmers will be playing with Kate Rudy. We are so pumped about it. And thanks again, River. Thank you so much.